What is up, Rescue House Online family? I want you to know first and foremost, just because you can't be here physically, maybe you're watching from somewhere uh, in the United States or abroad, I want you to know you might be watching from a distance, but we consider you family. And so we're in this series, we're in the season where we're preparing our hearts to give a big offering uh, to expand the ministry of Rescue House. And can I just tell you what God is doing here is not normal. We're in the middle of a miracle here and I want to give you a chance uh, to play your part in that every week we're uh, able to put content on this website for you for free and it allows us to minister to you no matter where you are and because your family we want to give you the opportunity to give to our heart for the house offering as well every year it's our year-end offering and uh, everything is tax deductible and so I want to ask you would you pray and ask God for a specific number to write on your heart that you could give and be obedient uh, to giving to the house of the Lord as our year-end offering approaches on December 17th. But you, you can give anytime between now and December the 31st. And I'm telling you, if you would give to this ministry, I know we would be blessed by it and, and you would be blessed by it as well. I'm telling you, what God is doing here is just unbelievable and we want to give you a chance to do that. So just pray and if you would give a gift uh, to our year-end offering, it would be amazing. We love you. We're going to keep these messages coming to you. God bless and we hope you have an incredible week. Well, how are we doing everybody? You excited to be here? Sunday morning. Hey, my name is Chris Holbrook. Um, I'm the creative pastor here at Rescue House, and I get the pleasure of welcoming you today um, and delivering God's word. I'm excited about that. But first thing, we got some special guests here today that I wanted to acknowledge. If you're here for the very first time, maybe you came with some family members, maybe you're just in town for Thanksgiving, you really are our honored guest. And we don't want a day to go by without acknowledging that you're here and just thanking you for being a part of what God is doing in this house. House. If you would do me a favor, and after the worship experience, if you would stop by our red VIP tent on your way out, we have a gift that we just want to place in your hands. We're all about giving here um, at Rescue House, and we want to give you a gift just to say that we're pumped to have you here with us. We call you our VIPs because that's exactly what you are. So maybe one time, church, can we give it up for our VIPs in the house this morning? Yeah. So we've been in this series called Imagine If, and we've been dreaming about some audacious things, dreaming about what God could do in our church, in the triad of North Carolina, through our church. And we've been uh, kind of leading up to this moment, uh, a heart for the house offering, where we're going to give above and beyond our tithes and uh, regular offerings so that we can see God do some uh, amazing things, things that are far beyond our imagination. And if you weren't here last week pastor actually gave everybody a giving kit and we have more of these giving kits inside of it he has a letter that he wrote specifically to everybody at rescue house um, so if you didn't get that last week on your way out you can grab one uh, on your way out the door um, and we're praying for God to do something above and beyond what we can ever think or imagine and this year we've been praying for this number we've been praying for a hundred thousand and that's what we believe that God's going to use to, to springboard us into 2018 and do ministry like we've never done before. So grab your giving kit on your way out if you didn't get it last week. Um, and the thing that I want to ask you is, what is your number? What part are you going to play in this miracle that God is doing right here in Moxville? Because I believe if we could all just get alone with God and pray and just seek him, God, what would you have me give to the Heart for the House offering? He's going to place a number on your heart, and if you're obedient in that, we're going to see him do all more than we could ever ask or imagine. Amen? So we just came out of this holiday called Thanksgiving. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Did you eat? It sounds like everybody had too much turkey because you're a little bit quiet this morning. I completely understand. Um, something that uh, you don't know about me is I actually don't really like turkey. And I know that's like 
probably a sin to say that around Thanksgiving, but I've just never really been a big fan of turkey, um, so I'll go for the ham. But hey, when I was growing up, um, I loved Thanksgiving because what Thanksgiving meant to me was it meant time with my family. And so this was Thanksgiving morning at the Holbrook's house. Like my mom and dad would be cooking. I would be in, uh, probably dressed up as a Native American, you know, basically just tying like stuff around my head and like pretending. Um, but I would be sitting on the couch watching the Macy's Day Parade. The fireplace was going. And it just meant that we got to just spend some quality time. And it was just me and my brother and my parents. And that was Thanksgiving for me growing up. Now, for my wife, Jessica, it's completely different. Like, it's the total opposite of that. If there are not 50 people gathered around three six-foot folding tables, then it's not a proper Thanksgiving for them. And that's just, it's just a polar opposite. So what happens now is um, we go to all these different Thanksgiving meals. We end up at probably about five or six uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday. And we'll go to her parents, we'll go to my dad's, we'll go to my mom's, we'll go to her mom's side of the family, her dad's side of the family. And so when we're going to all these five different places, we never would bring food with us because by the time that you went to the first two places, like your good stuff was gone, right? Like you, the stuff that you made for the first two places, they got the jackpot. Um, and by the third place, you were so sick of food. Like you don't even want to think about it. You don't want it sitting in your car. Like, no, we're just not going to bring anything with us. And I remember the year that my dad pulled me aside and he said, next year, you're bringing something with you. To Thanksgiving. He was upset because he was doing all the work. He was uh, making all the food, and he was like, next year, you better be bringing something with you to Thanksgiving. And that's actually what I like about Thanksgiving now, is that everyone brings something with them, right? Like, everybody will bring a dish, and then that way, it's not just all on one person, and especially if that person can't cook, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you have some reserves just in case, um, they mess up the turkey, but everybody brings something with them, and then you have an abundance of food. You have a full table of food, and you might not be able to bring the turkey with you to Thanksgiving, but you can bring something, right? Like, maybe you can bring the mac and cheese made with real cheese, not like any of that fake stuff made with real cheese, right? Um, what about the mashed potatoes? You got to have mashed potatoes, gravy, stuffing. And we're in the South, so what do you got to have? Sweet tea. That's exactly right. You have to have sweet tea. So somebody's got to bring the sweet tea. And maybe you can't bring any of that stuff, but maybe you can bring like the silverware, the plates, the napkins, things like that. Um, but everybody brings something so that you have an abundance of food at your Thanksgiving meal. And everybody will surround the table and that's a picture, actually, of the church. That's how the church is supposed to be. You see, when everyone brings something to the table, there's food in God's house. When everybody plays their part and they bring something to the table, there's an abundance of food in God's house so that lost people, they can come in, they can be nourished by the Spirit of God. It's when everyone brings something to the table. God just doesn't want you to show up just to consume like me, back in the day when my dad had to pull me aside and say, no, you're bringing something next time. He doesn't want you just to show up to consume. He wants you to play a part. And when we bring something to the table, there will be food in God's house. And if we want to see God do the unimaginable in 2018, we got to be able be willing to do the unimaginable with this heart for the house offering. We got to be willing to go above and beyond to see God do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. So today, I want to look at a story of a woman who came and gave a great gift to Jesus. And she gave this gift out of anticipation of what Jesus was about to do. She gave it just knowing that he was the Messiah, knowing that he was going to save the world from its sins. And she gave this gift. And kind of give you a little bit of context. So I feel like if we don't have a context of this 
story. We're not going to quite understand what's happening here. So we're about two days out from this festival called Passover. And so the whole nation of Israel is getting excited for this national holiday that's coming up. I mean, I'm talking about like you go to the grocery store and they've run out of milk, they've run out of eggs, they've run out of pumpkin spice, everything, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like Thanksgiving. Like so everybody is getting excited and they're asking, okay, where are you going to spend Passover at? Are you going to your mom's house? Are you going um, to your friend's house? Where are you spending uh, Passover at? So there's a buzz going on around this time that we find Jesus. And he's actually sitting around a table with people. And some of the greatest moments that we see in our lives are surrounding a table, right? Like some of the greatest conversations that you've had with your family have been around the table. Some of the worst moments have been around the table too. But this is one of those good moments where we find Jesus gathered around a table. And it's in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said. Or the people may riot. So the, the bad guys, the religious people in this uh, story, they're trying to kill Jesus, but they know the importance of this festival that's coming up, so they're not going to do anything in this. And then Jesus, he finds himself around a table in a city of, uh, called Bethany, which is right outside the city of Jerusalem. And he's there at this guy named Simon the leper's house. Now, what a terrible nickname, right? Like, Simon the leper. Like, yeah, Jesus, we understand that you healed him from leprosy, but do you got to call him Simon the leper? Like, is he going down in history with that type of name? But I think that speaks to what uh, the heart of Jesus is. He's willing to surround a table with lepers. He's willing to surround a table with the outcast. He's willing to surround a table with the fringes of society who nobody else would surround a table with. He's willing to sit down and commune with them. When all of a sudden, a woman kind of breaks into the party. Uh, we don't know in this story if she was invited to the party or if she just kind of broke in. And she heads straight for Jesus. And this is what it says in verse 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, Simon the leper, great nickname, um, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very per- expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So everybody in the crowd that's watching this, they're frozen because out of nowhere, this woman walks in with this alabaster jar. She breaks it and she pours it over Jesus's head. Now, very quickly, the room realizes what's inside of this jar because they can smell it. It has a sweet scent. It has a spicy scent to it. And everybody realizes she just broke a jar of nard and poured it over Jesus' head. Now, none of us in here, we know what nard is, right? Like, I still am not quite 100% sure that I know what nard is. But in their time, they understood what she just did. It would have cost her about 300 denarii to buy this alabaster jar of perfume. This would have been one of her most prized possessions. And to kind of give you a little bit of context, one denarii would have been about a day's worth of wages. So if we take it into like our modern time, and even if we say it's um, minimum wage 725, if you multiply that out, it would be about $17,400 that she poured out on Jesus. So now your jaw kind of drops, right? Like now you understand like, wow, that's an expensive bottle of perfume, right? Like, and she breaks it. She pours it on Jesus's head. And finally, someone in the crowd like speaks up and they're like, what did you just do? Don't you understand how expensive that is? Why did you just do that? And the text says in verse 4, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. 
So they realized what this perfume was, and they realized the cost of this perfume. And they started to get upset because they're like, man, we could have sold that. We could have fed thousands of people, even though Jesus can feed thousands of people with like five loaves and two fish, right? But they're focused on the cost of this gift, and they're not focused on the impact. So they just start tearing into her. They start yelling at her. They're rebuking her. They're trying to demonize this woman for the gift that she gave to Jesus. But Jesus says this, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. And this is kind of a weird story because we find this story in the book of Mark in between two stories of plots to kill Jesus. So the religious people, they're trying to kill Jesus. They're trying to snuff out the message of love that he has because they think that he's not of God when in fact he actually is the very son of God. So they're trying to kill him. They're setting up plots to kill him. And then we find this one story in between there. And we see this a lot through the book of Mark, and they're called Mark and Sandwiches. So like any good sandwich, you have two loaves or two uh, slices of bread, right? But really, what's the most important part of a sandwich? What's in the middle, right? Like you're not excited about your white bread on the outside. You're excited about the roast beef or maybe for our case, the leftover turkey and mayonnaise sandwich that we're making with leftover turkey. What's important is what's right in the middle. And Jesus is trying to pinpoint and show us how beautiful this gift is that this woman gave. And he's trying to give us this message right here. Extravagance shows importance. Extravagance shows importance. Because you'll sacrifice for things that are important to you. You put priorities on things that are important to you. And she knew that Jesus was important. She knew that he could do miraculous things in Israel. She actually knew him as Messiah, the one that would take away the sins of the world. She knew how important Jesus was. And she gave a gift at that level. She anticipated something was going to happen and her level of anticipation determined her level of sacrifice. She was willing to sacrifice at the level of anticipation that she had for Jesus. She knew that Jesus was going to take away the sins of the world. And she knew that she was going to give at that level. So what level of anticipation do you have? Do you believe that God's going to show up and do a miracle? In your life, do you believe that God's going to show up and do a miracle in our church? What do you believe in God for in 2018? We should give at that level of anticipation. Maybe, let me break it down like this. You see, we have expectations when we go, um, let's say, out to eat, right? We have expectations for what the food is going to be like. We have an anticipation of what we're going to experience. So what anticipation do you have when you go to Mickey D's? I mean, it's going to fill my stomach, right? What about when you go to Five Guys, you know, it's a, it's a little bit higher. But what, let's say that we went to Longhorn Steakhouse. We're going to have a higher anticipation, right? What if we went to Ruth's Chris? We're going to have an exceedingly abundant anticipation, right? And we're willing to sacrifice based on our anticipation, based on our expectation. We're going to sacrifice. You would never go to McDonald's and spend $50 on a hamburger, because that's not your level of anticipation. But you totally would on a steak at Ruth's Chris. Your level of anticipation determines your level of sacrifice. So if we're anticipating 10,000 lost people crossing from death to life here in the triad, we should give at that level of anticipation. 
And maybe you're in here today and like you've heard us talk about 10,000 and kind of in the back of your mind you're thinking like, that's never going to happen. I want to show you who Jesus is. And I want you to get out your Bible. I want you to read it, especially in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we see thousands of people cross from death to life on a daily basis. I believe that God could do a miracle here. He could cross 10,000 lost people from death to life through our house. And he can do immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. So let's give at our level of anticipation. If you want to see a miracle take place, we must be willing to give at that level. So kind of back to the story, we see this woman, she comes in and she breaks open this jar and she pours it out on Jesus. We realize that it's $17,000 worth of perfume that she breaks and pours over top of Jesus. And what I love is that she doesn't just pour a little bit. She doesn't just take the cap off and pour a little bit and try to save some for later. What does she do? She actually breaks open the jar. And I don't know about you, but if you have, if like I've ever tried to uh, put liquid back into a broken jar, it ain't gonna happen. Like <laughs> when you break a jar and it has liquid inside of it, it's not going back in that jar. There's no way to save it. So this woman, she breaks the jar, she pours it out on Jesus almost as an act of, I'm giving it all. Like, I'm giving it all to you. I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to give it all to you. And maybe you're in here today, and you actually have been praying for that number that God has placed, uh, going to place on your heart. And he placed a number on your heart, and you're saying to God, okay, I will give you half of that. I will give you half of that number. I want you to ask you to trust God. If he placed that number on your heart, give it all. Because he's going to bless you on the backside. We'll see that here in a moment. Her extravagance showed importance. We all make sacrifices. We all spend time on things that are important to us. I just want to ask you, if somebody were to look at your life, what would they see as most important in your life? It's going to be what you spend your time, your energy, your resources on. This lady, she gave it all, and this is what happens at the end of this story. In verse 9, Jesus continues, he says, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So Jesus, he calls this uh, ridiculously extravagant gift beautiful, and he tells this woman, everybody is going to remember this gift that you gave me here today. And we actually see that in Scripture. All four gospel accounts tell this story of a woman that comes in and she anoints Jesus. And I love one version of it. Um, it comes in the book of John. I love what it says here in John 12, 3. And it's not on the screen's production, so don't stress about that. It says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume." Now, so this woman, she comes in, she breaks open this jar, she pours out all of this expensive perfume onto Jesus in a hope that she can bless Jesus, that she can give to Jesus. And what happens on the flip side is that everyone in the house was blessed. The fragrance filled the entire house. Everybody could smell this sweet perfume. They were all blessed by it and that's the thing about when you bring what you have to the table the whole house is blessed when we give to this offering on December 17th I'm telling you the entire triad of North Carolina will be blessed by it and it's going to go far beyond what we could ever think or imagine 
It'll be immeasurably more and reach far past where we could ever reach. That's something that I've been praying for in 2017 is that God would continue just to give us a reach beyond our reach. What if we could reach more people like Jenna who states away with the gospel of of Christ? What if we could reach people across the world and share the love and the hope that we have in Christ? I believe that we can do that, but it's, it's all based on our level of anticipation and our willingness to sacrifice to that. Imagine, just like this woman, what if our gift went far beyond our lifetime? You see, this woman, she lived 2,000 years ago. No, we, we don't even know her name from this story, right? But her gift has lived through generation after generation after generation. And we actually celebrate that gift today. What if your gift could outlive you as well? What if your gift could go far beyond and it could touch your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? What if a whole new generation rose up because you gave to this heart for the house offering and they made a difference? I believe that we could see the entire landscape of North Carolina transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ because of our sacrifice on December 17th. I believe that we can see our nation transformed because of our sacrifice on December 17th. And I don't know about you, but I'm... I want to give at that level of sacrifice. I want to see God do immeasurably more than what we could ever think or imagine. And forever she'll be remembered for this gift. And we celebrate that gift today. And the only reason why we can celebrate her gift is because of the gift that Jesus Christ gave. You got to understand that Jesus gave himself his very self so that we could have eternal life with God so that we could have a brand new life so that we could be free from our sins and just like this woman gave it all Jesus gave it all he laid down his very life you can't give anything greater than your life there's nothing more that you could give but Jesus gave it all And today, we're going to celebrate the fact that he gave himself through a thing called communion. So right now, we're actually going to set some stuff up in here um, for communion. But I just wanted to get us kind of in the right mindset before we take communion together. And kind of explain the importance of communion. Because maybe you're here for the very first time, like in You've heard about communion, but you've never really understood what it was. Or maybe you've just given your life to Christ and you don't really understand what communion is either. I wanted to walk through what Paul, one of the main writers in the New Testament, shared about communion. And it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus gave himself up to be beaten, to be spit on, and ultimately to be nailed to a cross. His body, his physical body was broken for our sins. He took the punishment that we actually deserve on himself and he gave himself up. And so when he sat down with his disciples, he wanted them to remember and he ultimately wants us to remember that sacrifice that he gave. That his body was physically broken. So he asked us to take the bread and break it and to eat it while remembering him remembering that sacrifice and further on he says in the same way after supper he took the cup saying 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. What he's saying here is he's kind of uh, sharing that this is a new covenant, something a little bit different than the old covenant. The old covenant required an animal sacrifice. It required the blood of an animal to, for the forgiveness of your sin. So if you sinned, you would actually have to have uh, an animal sacrifice every single time that you sinned. But Jesus is saying, my blood covers all your sins. So no longer do you have to keep bringing sacrifice after sacrifice, but every single sin is covered by my blood. And he's sharing the wine is a representation of that. And as you drink the wine, I want you to remember that I shed my blood on the cross so that you could have that forgiveness of sins. And that forgiveness was total and ultimate for you. He continues on in verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What you're doing when you're remembering this time as you eat the bread, as you drink the wine, you're remembering that his death was for you, but he's also coming back. He's risen to new life, and he's bringing us into eternal glory. In verse 27, Paul kind of shares a little bit of a warning. He says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. He's giving us this warning. He's saying, don't just come haphazardly to the table. Don't just come up and have your mind focused on other things. This is to remember what Christ did for us, and that should be our focus as we take communion together. We should focus on the sacrifice that he gave for us and not the football game or work that we have this week or anything else. And he's actually kind of saying like, hey, if, if you examine yourself and you can't really focus on that, or maybe your mind's just off somewhere else, maybe it's just better if you don't actually take communion. But I think Paul's ultimately saying, hey, let's examine ourselves so that we can actually get ourselves in the right mindset as we focus in on Jesus. And he continues on, that's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, when you gather to take communion, you should all eat together. And that's our word for today. Let's be together. Let's be united in this. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite everybody forward. And we actually have two stations up front here, two in the back. And I want us to take communion together. And especially if you're a guy in here, I want you to lead your family in this moment. Maybe you'll find just a, a quiet place you grab the bread, you grab the wine, you find a, a silent place, and you just lead your family through this. If you don't know what to say, that's okay. Maybe you just pray. But take this opportunity to lead your family in this together. Let's focus on that sacrifice. Maybe you're in here and... You feel maybe unworthy, or maybe you're in here and you've never had that moment where you've placed your faith in Christ. I've actually asked the Next Steps team, they're going to be up front here after I pray, and they would love to pray with you. Maybe you're concerned that you don't have the right heart to take communion this morning. Come, get some prayer with them, talk with them for a moment before you take communion. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and when I say amen, you'll actually be dismissed to the tables. And then once you've taken communion, just slip back into your seat, and we'll close up the day after that. We're also going to have some scripture just scrolling on the screens just to remember Christ, to get us in that right mindset of what Jesus did for us. Amen? So pray with me. Father God, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for your gift of your son that was total. You gave it all. We're just grateful for that. I pray for the person that's in here today that's been struggling just with a greed or lack of generosity in their heart. I pray that you would just reach into their heart today. That you would help them give at the level of anticipation that you have for them. Jesus, we focus on your sacrifice. That you gave it all. Your body was broken. You poured out your blood and you gave us eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. And we remember this today in your name. Amen.